Welcome everyone to Baruch. Sorry for the delay, uh, but the food came. And you all came, so thank you. We, we have a sellout, so we hope that we'll get more of the chairs filled before we're, we're finished. Uh, this is a very interesting book, and it's going to be a very interesting discussion. I hope all of you will get in on it as we go. Uh, I'm going to introduce Linda Hartley, who is the uh, one of the co-authors. Vivian Hexter is sitting right here in front of me as the other co-author. Uh, they also work for H2 Growth Strategies. Uh, and this book, as you're going to find out, uh, is a wonderful uh, discussion of interviews with leading people in philanthropy and nonprofit organizations who have a lot of wise and interesting things to say about uh, our democracy, about fundraising, about priorities, and many, many other topics that I, you're going to hear about in a much clearer and more articulate way from Linda in just a minute. Uh, this is the first of uh, what will be several uh, book discussions that we're going to sponsor. I'm, I'm Jack Krauskopf. I'm the director of the Center for Nonprofit Strategy and Management, which is a part of the Mark School of Public and International Affairs at Baruch. It's a long name, but uh, it, it had a good endowment gift that uh, created it, so <laughs> <laughs> we don't mind saying it. Uh, the, actually, it's the Austin W. Mark School of Public and International Affairs. Um, and we'll, we'll be doing something in March on March 15th as well, and uh, more to say about that uh, uh, toward the end tonight. Uh, but this is a, an excellent book to uh, start our discussion of nonprofit issues. Uh, Linda is a former colleague. We both worked together at the New School many years ago. I won't try to count the number. Uh, but she's also been a, a senior uh, official at uh, Cooper Union, at Columbia, uh, and uh, Bard College, as well as the New York Public Library, as well as her new school experience. Uh, and she's uh, a leading person in nonprofit organization development and related activities. Uh, is, is on a number of uh, important coalitions, including the Equal Pay Coalition of New York City, which I just pick out of her bio because it's so germane to what's going on in, uh, in, in our country at this point. It's one of the major issues. Uh, it's a terrific panel. Uh, we did lose our moderator to the being under the weather, and uh, one of the panel members who uh, was not able to get here from Baltimore from the Casey Foundation, known as Sykes, uh, but uh, Linda is going to talk about some of her views as one of the people interviewed in the book. So uh, the, the format is Linda will introduce the other panel members, tell us a little bit about what's in the book and what some of the important themes are, uh, and then there'll be some discussion by the panel, and then we'll open it up to hear from all of you. So thank you for being here. Thanks to Linda and to Vivian as co-author and to the panel members uh, who will now be introduced. I won't clap for myself. Uh, Vivian Hexter, my business partner and co-author of the book, and I are just thrilled to be here today uh, here at Baruch College with our distinguished panelists, Keisha Gaskin, Nathan, and Evan Wolfson. And uh, Jack Kraskoff, uh, as, as he said, we've, uh, we've been colleagues for a long time from coming from the new school. Uh, Michael Seltzer was our moderator, and I just wanted to uh, uh, thank him again for helping to shape this program and, uh, and plan it. And uh, I, I wanted to tell you that he's, he's really the author of uh, a book called Securing Your Organization's Future. Uh, uh, I've had the pleasure of using it and reading it uh, for about 12 years as an adjunct faculty member at NYU. It really remains a definitive book on nonprofit planning and fundraising. Mm -hmm. Keisha Gaskins Nathan is the director 
for the Democratic Practice United States Program at the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. Keisha is a longtime organizer, lobbyist, and trial attorney. Prior to joining the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, she was senior counsel at the Brennan Center for Justice, mm. serving as the director of the Redistricting and Representation Program. She's the author of a number of articles and publications re related to voter suppression, voter voting rights, and redistricting. Evan Wolfson is an attorney and an LGBTQ activist. He is the founder and president of Freedom to Marry, a group favoring same-sex marriage in the United States. Wolfson, who many consider to be the father and leader of the same-sex marriage movement, authored the book, Why Marriage Matters, America, Equality, and Gay People's Right to Marry, uh, which Time Out, a uh, New York magazine called perhaps the most important gay marriage primer ever written. He is listed as one of the Time Magazine's most 100 influential people in the world. My business partner and co-author Vivian Hexter is also here, as I said, and we uh, are continuing to celebrate the publication of our first book, Big Impact, Insights and Stories from America's Nonprofit Leaders. In interviewing nearly 50 leaders across the country, we asked personal, professional, and policy-related questions. Uh, including, what is your organization doing to address racial inequity, both internally and externally? In a few minutes, when we start the panel discussion, uh, we'll start with that question. The book combines our findings and recommendations on what drives social change with 21 in-depth interviews out of the 50, uh, portraying some of the most compelling, profound, and successful change leaders. We see this book as a way to give nonprofit leaders a larger voice uh, in their, to share the most important things that they've learned in their lives and their careers, and to share the good news, really, across the country about affecting positive social change. Uh, in the book, we identify seven principles uh, that uh, contribute towards uh, creating positive so social change. Principles start from the inside of the organization with the leader and then move outward uh, with the organization and then uh, to the larger social se sector. The first principle is to sharpen your own leadership skills. There were many aspects to this that people talked about, uh, but one particularly sta stood out was that many of the leaders focused on succession planning no matter how long they were at the organization. Uh, other aspects were building emotional intelligence and self-awareness, working in direct service, which I'll mention a, a little bit more later, seeking out and cultivating uh, mentors, and achieving life balance. Now, we asked Aria Finger of DoSomething.org about planning for the inevitable. Uh, she's young. She's under 40. Uh, she runs DoSomething.org, and uh, the organization encourages social activism among young people ages 17 to 25. They describe themselves as a global movement for good. And they now have 5.5 million young people creating positive social change, both online and off. Uh, she told us that Do Something was activating young people in every US area code and in 131 countries. In, the, in this quote from the book, Aria is speaking about the founder do some, of DoSomething.org, Nancy Loveland. Nancy Loveland is one of the, those people who lifts everyone up. I was 25 or 26, and she took me out for a hot chocolate. She said, you're going to be the next CEO of Do Something. I'm grooming you to be the next CEO. I didn't believe her. I didn't even remember if I said no, but I thought no. But she was true to her word. She has given me so much, and the only reason I'm successful today is because of her. When it comes to working uh, in direct service, Dorothy Stoneman of Youth Build gave an important piece of advice to people entering the nonprofit sector. Embed yourself in, completely, in a completely different community long enough to make a difference. Your life will be shaped by the choices you make in your 20s. Uh, to date, youth build, youth build students have built over 33,000 units of affordable housing in the United States, plus uncounted community centers, 
playgrounds and schools worldwide. The second principle is for creating lasting social change is to ensure your own house is in order, that your organization is sound culturally and that it is functional. We noticed that leaders we interviewed focused on recruiting talented, passionate employees, giving them autonomy in decision making, surrounding themselves with people smarter than they are, investing time in managing their boards of directors, and addressing diversity, equity, and inclusion. Keisha knows we interviewed Stephen Hines of the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. On this last point about addressing diversity, Stephen said that while the staff was diverse, the foundation chose to take a deeper dive, which included third-party confidential staff surveys and, uh, and interviews, confidential interviews. These group conversations and confidential surveys revealed uh, that more was needed uh, to ensure everyone felt safe enough to have the uncomfortable conversations that would help move the organization forward. So he said to his staff, well, why don't those of you who are really interested in this or have some ideas or concerns about it, get together, and then come back and tell us what you want, what you think would be the right way to broaden and deepen the conversation. Bill Olfelder, Executive Director of the Nature Conservancy in New York State, shared that the Nature Conservancy is a disproportionately white organization, and that they were, there was a growing awareness about the value of being more diverse in terms of ethnicity, socioeconomics, and gender. He believes that a lot of this has to do with leadership, starting at the top, setting an example, and listening to the younger, shorter tenured trustees in this case, who bring different, a different mindset and are willing to challenge the old guard leadership. The organization opened its first diversity discussion with a panel of trustees, and then uh, talking to them about their experiences as female scientists, female political organization, organizers, women in the financial sector, and women of color. Uh, once, they made real, once they make real progress with the board, then they will move on to uh, their external partnerships. Uh, they've been working with uh, a consultant, a third party, independent consultant on staff diversity for over three years now. We asked Nonette Sykes of the Annie E. Casey Foundation what opportunities she saw for the foundation over the next five years. She said, I see us applying our racial and ethnic equity and inclusion knowledge, tools, and strategies more precisely to our work over the next few years with much better understanding and articulation of root causes. <laughs> we will also be testing our messaging strategies, like how to articulate our commitments around racial and ethnic equity. We will also be implementing an equity scorecard that will allow us to track and measure our progress towards operationalizing the foundation's commitment to equity and inclusion across five core areas, programmatic strategy, governance, operations, human resources, and investments. <coughs> what Casey is really aiming to do is to have a culture that normalizes conversations about racial equity. The fourth principle is to campaign on many fronts. We observe that leaders are making progress in affecting social change. Uh, they're doing this in different ways. Some elements of campaigning on many fronts include finding common ground, changing social norms, uh, litigating when, when, when needed, using social science and public education and messaging, and fully advocating for your cause. Evan Wolfson here today and Dan Gross were generous in sharing uh, their insights and perspectives on this principle. Dan Gross was until recently the head of the Brady Center for, uh, uh, to prevent gun violence. He and many, many others actually that we interviewed experienced life shattering tragedies over the course of their careers. In uh, 1997, Dan's brother was shot in an attack on top of the Empire State Building. Uh, his brother, uh, uh, went into a coma and needed multiple surgeries that he's still recovering from. Uh, Dan's dear friend at the same time was killed by the gunman. Dan moved from being a partner at the advertising firm J. Walter Thompson uh, to founding PAX, a violence prevention center for youth, and then leading the Brady Center uh, after that. 
at both the Brady Center and PACS, Dan looked at, the, at it from the perspective of social norm change. At PACS, he led the creation of public health and safety campaigns that encouraged parents to ask, just simply ask, if there are guns in the homes of where their kids play. It was simply called the Ask Campaign. Dan said, and I quote, we are not here to make social commentary on guns, and we don't come from hatred of guns or people who own them. We come here with a single-minded desire to prevent people from getting shot. That has led us to the insights based on common ground that almost every American shares, and which have the potential to make this country and everyone who lives here much safer. The fifth principle is to build broad-based coalitions uh, to forward your goal. That includes seeking partnerships, leveraging your organization's convening influence, including communities of faith. Leon Botstein, president of Bard College, talks about this. Fundraising aggressively and engaging with the rest of the social sector. Tara Perry, head of the National CASA, the Court Appointed Special Advocates, said nonprofits should take a closer look at how for profit businesses form collaborations, uh, strategic alliances, and corporate uh, legal integrations like partnerships, joint ventures, management service organizations, and mergers. We advise small nonprofits whose nimble and innovative contributions to the nonprofit sector advance many causes to consider merging as a strategic growth option, coming from a position of strength and success, not from a position of weakness. Uh, for example, when the founder is about to leave or get carried out, or when longtime funders are moving in another direction. Principle number six is to persist. We heard most of our leaders say that the problems they are addressing were not caused in a day and will take a long time to solve. Anyone interested in making positive social change must commit to the long haul. Focus on winning, but accept that you cannot win everything. Thank you, Evan. Evan, Evan Wilson knows about persisting. He worked on making gay marriage legal for more than 30 years, starting with his law school thesis, proclaiming the gay community should, take no, should not take no for an answer. He knew gay people had been dreaming about uh, freedom to marry for decades before the thesis. He believed that fighting for the freedom to marry would be, and I quote, claiming a vocabulary of empathy and shared values that would be an engine of transformation. And that dream was realized in 2015. The questions Vivian and I asked uh, the nearly 50 leaders in the book, uh, Big Impact, elicited inspiring stories about triumphs and tragedies, about gain and loss, we also heard about the practical aspects of sparking social change. Great leaders call forth the best in us because they balance head and heart, intellect and soul. And like the leaders that we interviewed in the book, I believe that we all share a deep desire to contribute to make this world a better place for now and for the future. And that we instinctively know that we can achieve more together than we can alone. Now, I, I know that we've got a hashtag and uh, it's a new world, so if you have uh, cell phones and you want to tweet or video or comment during this session, you're welcome to do it. And the hashtag is H2Growth underscore, H number two growth underscore. So let's continue the conversation uh, as we examine leadership through the lens of social justice. Evan and Keisha, as you know, the first question we have for you is, what is your organization doing to address racial equity internally and externally? I guess I'm first, because I'm closest to the podium. <coughs> <coughs> All right, well, good evening, everyone. OK, that was <coughs> terrible. <laughs> so we're going to start this again. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. All right, now I know I'm amongst friends, and I feel like we can talk. <laughs> Um, the Rockefeller Brother Fund is a public charity. We've been around 75 years. Um, our uh, mission is to build an interdependent world. Uh, we move um, in grants about $50 million a year. Uh, we have three thematic areas, sustainable development, peace building, and democratic practice. We also have a strong emphasis on arts and culture. Um, we have two pivotal places, southern China and western Balkans. 
Um, and as I talk about our external work around race, race and racial justice, I'm not <coughs> going to spend very much time on Southern China and the Western Balkans. Not because there aren't issues in these areas, but it's, they're just not in terms of frameworks and what we're talking about here. There's not much of a frame of reference and we would spend all our time talking about comparative race in you know, Southern China. Fascinating, but not what we're here to do today. Um, and so I'll start a little with sort of our internal work. And um, as was referenced in the book, um, Stephen really has worked really hard to lead a diversity, equity, and inclusion initiative um, within the organization. Um, and it has successfully diversified our staff. Um, it has successfully um, initiated an organizational culture program that um, is an ongoing iterative process that um, has a lot of intensive work and then does allow us to step back. Um, it is the kind of work that you can't constantly be at all the time. It's exhausting. Um, and you do have to kind of step forward and step back and really recognizing that asking the hard questions and engaging in the space is something that you have to do on a regular basis, but also recognizing the ability to move forward and move back in these spaces is also very important. So looking at that level of engagement as we do our DEI work um, is pretty important. And so we are committed to doing that. One thing, so, um, so one of the things I, I struggled with was how to talk about DEI um, from my voice and how much from an institutional voice. So that was my institutional voice. Now Keisha's gonna say something. <laughs> So when we talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, this, this work is not about intentionality. It's about outcomes. We have a tendency to get caught up in, we really meant to do well. So our diversity work is good and strong because we went in with very strong and positive intentions. And the fact is, what you intended to do almost doesn't matter in most cases. The fact is there are strong outcomes that we should be looking to define as we think about this work. Diversity and equity are measurable outcomes. How you diversify an organization or an institution is measurable. You can define that measurement and it's not about intention. Did you do it or did you not? Equity is measurable, right? When we look at disparities, are they bigger? Or are they smaller? Are people of color getting paid the same or are they not? Are women getting paid the same or are they not? Measurable, right? Now inclusion is kind of funky, right? It isn't necessarily measurable. Inclusion is about process, it's about culture, it's about behavior. These are things that are very difficult to measure and define. They're almost feelings and processes. And it is about sort of an institutional culture and can you do it, can you do it right? However, there are some signals right if you have strong diversity and you're meeting your numbers and your equity is failing there's a very real possibility your inclusion is not doing very well right there are signals within the process and how this works um, and so it's just something to think about so I always think about in the frame of diversity inclusion and equity but that spells die so no one wants to do that so we still continue to do DEI um, but it is something to think about that as we think about this work um, that we move away from an intentionality frame, look, about, look at it as an outcome frame, look at solid measurements when measurements are appropriate, and be very purposeful in the process and recognize that process is more than going through motions, but a deep incorporation and intentionality around uh, behavior and culture within our organizations. And so um, the second part of the question is externally, right? And so we make grants. <coughs> <clears throat> so our external work is um, manifest in how we move resources into the world. Um, and so as we look at our thematic areas um, and our arts and culture work, um, so specifically in our arts and culture, we have a deep commitment to performative and visual arts that address, um, that address these questions from, uh, from these racial justice lenses. Um, whether it is um, whether it's specific performances, I think most recently one of the big things we supported was um, an opera at the Apollo um, called "We Shall Not Be Moved," and it was um, the story of these uh, homeless youth in Philadelphia going through an experience, and they were visited by ghosts that from the bombing in the Philadelphia. It was like 
I cannot do it justice, but it was <laughs> this amazing experience that was told from this historical frame um, that was that kind of work. But in addition to doing that kind of work in our arts and cultural program, we also support affordable housing for artists in the city of New York, right? So artists remain in the city that artists can have long-term affordable housing in the capacity in doing their work within the city. So it's not just do we support production of things, but recognizing that artists have to be part of the culture and fiber of New York City. Um, if we look at our sustainable development program, we specifically work on both looking at our environmental justice work with organizations like We Act in Harlem, as well as um, expanding um, expanding and supporting traditional enviro, uh, environmental organizations which historically have been largely white movements, um, to really start looking at how they engage and interact with communities of color and really looking at what that looks like and really funding them to do meaningfully deep work in those spaces as well. Our peace building program focuses on Israel, Palestine, and Afghanistan. Um, so again, those frames can be a little funky as we talk about race, but particularly our work in Palestine I think is really interesting um, and really looking at um, rights and connections and behaviors and conduct where we see parallels particularly with minority and underserved <coughs> and underrepresented populations in this country, right? So some of it is um, parallel practices, right? So parallel practices around education and other things. Some of it is actually looking at businesses, security businesses. The same businesses that train security troops for the West Bank are the same businesses that train private security for inner city schools in, in St. Louis, right? That, like, where are we seeing these sort of parallel tactics, practices, and behaviors for communities internationally, and what are those behaviors, and how are we seeing these translations of racist behaviors around the country and around the world, and what do we think about those types of connections? So we see that work coming through in, in our um, peace building work as well, and recognizing we can't talk about world peace and not talk about race. Um, so finally, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about democratic practice, and that's my area. Um, of the $50 million we dedicate, we are extremely dedicated to democratic practice. 16% of our overall giving comes out of my portfolio. Um, and we support organizations um, that, uh, that, that do different things around racial equity. So we have organizations you may have heard of, like Color of Change working on district attorney's races, civil rights, direct action strategies, um, divestment strategies from organizations that advance um, racist policies and legislation around the country. Um, the writer's room work, I don't know if you're aware of this, um, Color of Change um, is actually working in Los Angeles to change some of the work of actual culture work of what's being written and what actually comes out, what shows up in our theaters and our televisions and all the places like that actually come when we talk about this work. So they do amazing, amazing work in these places. Um, NAACP Legal Defense Fund, the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, looking at voting rights work. Demos, doing amazing work around equity and the economy. Um, the Roosevelt Institute, racial rules of the economy. In this book, write it down, the hidden rules of race looking at the, the dynamic of race in our economy and how there are racist rules in our economy that actually prop up these, these ongoing issues and really looking at the dynamic of not just, not just democracy in this sort of pristine kind of way, but what is the relationship between democracy and our economy and is there a racial dynamic between how these things prop up each other in really negative and, and unsupported in ways that undermine the ability of communities to work together and support themselves. Um, organizations, I'll just name off the top of my head, Asian Americans Advancing Justice, the Southern Coalition for Social Justice, the Youth Engagement Fund, working with young people, Latino, AAPI, African American, working with both youth and millennials. I separate those groups. Sorry, millennials, the oldest millennials are 39 this year. You're not youth anymore. And so we do identify youth and millennials as not necessarily the same group, but I think it's an important distinction to make. Millennials an important population, but youth is still youth, and we really do have to think about what that looks like. Um, so broadly, we insist upon these strategies um, implicate underrepresented populations. Uh, we look at we look at underrepresent underrepresentation, um, not just people feeling under underrepresented. We've got a lot of tension in our country right now around race and a lot of these questions, and a lot of folks 
in majority populations feeling underrepresented, feeling that their needs aren't being addressed. And while those feelings are legitimate, in fact, these populations are not underrepresented. 17% of our country elects 50% of our Senate. That 17% is largely white middle class America. We do not actually work and fund working on representation in those populations. They're not underrepresented. So we really do look not just at these ideas and concepts, but actually what are we talking about with representation? How are we talking about redistricting? How are we talking about actual representation? And what are these mechanisms that we deal with? We also look at systems and systemic questions around um, justice questions, economic questions, right? So when we talk about systems, one of the examples I like to give is we look at, when we talk about some of the economic dynamics, we look at ways to make it not just easier to be poor, but to actually change our economic structures so poverty isn't a condition that pervades the same population generation after generation. So that's some of the ways we think about race, both internally and externally at the RBF. Thank you. Your turn. Thank you. <laughs> <coughs> so uh, on one level, my answer actually is going to be a lot shorter because <laughs> freedom to, not because that wasn't worth hearing, <laughs> but because freedom to marry, having achieved its mission and uh, delivered on the goal and the strategy that we drove, fulfilled its commitment to go out of business. So mm -hmm. we don't have ongoing programs. I don't have a staff anymore. We, we don't do the kinds of work on the, on the fault lines and frontiers that Keisha just sketched out so well. So that's, that's sort of the cheat, easy answer. Uh, but I would say, actually, I think Keisha made a number of really very strong, interesting points. I particularly like your discussion of uh, the overlap, but also distinction between diversity and inclusion and the way to measure them in terms of equity. I think that's a very useful mm -hmm. uh, way for people to think about terms that can become kind of buzzwords. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, aspirations, but not necessarily have a clear uh, pathway for the work that's needed. And I think mm -hmm. you sketched that out very well. The, the one thing I would actually just add to what Keisha laid out is that, and this does draw on some of the uh, ethos and approach of freedom to marry, is that while there are certainly justice arguments and morality arguments and individual arguments for lifting people up and finding ways to improve in diversity and inclusion and result in equity. Uh, the part that I would emphasize is that I think it's important for people to understand why these things are important and not just as a matter of justice or the claims of the people who are underrepresented or uh, unjustly treated or denied opportunity, but also that there are real values to everyone in creating and, ex and um, succeeding in diversity and inclusion and the resultant equity, which is not just the equity for the people formerly out now in, but for all of us. That uh, there's tons of scholarship and research showing that teams are more successful when they are diverse, when they are mixed, when different people of different talent or, and different views and different perspectives and different backgrounds are able to contribute. And uh, that, therefore, there's an interest for all of us in solving these problems, addressing these problems, doing better. It's not an us-them thing because, actually, we all benefit, and therefore, the community and the country and the economy mm -hmm. benefit uh, when, we, when we get these things right, or certainly when we get them better. The other thing I'll just add, and I'm, I'm, I know Keisha agrees with this, but you did at several points come to race, and obviously race is a very central arena in which these questions are uh, necessarily now having to be addressed and improved. But diversity and inclusion are important for everybody. It's important for the empowerment of women. It's important for the empowerment of gay people, of transgender people, of people from different backgrounds, economic, social, cultural, religious, et cetera. So, uh, there are many to be fair, the question was about race. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> That's why you gave a good answer. <laughs> um, but I do think it's important to not let it only be about race because uh, for the reasons I stated earlier, mm -hmm. I think the larger enterprise on which we all need to do better uh, really affects everybody and, and benefits from bringing everybody in and showing that there is going to be uh, improvement for all of us when we do better for each of us. 
Can I respond just for a second? And so two things I want to say. One, um, the point I made was not to be divisive, and I and no, I apologize no, no. if mm. it came off. Not that at way. all. It was just it was just to to provide clarity around the issue of underrepresentation when we talk about democracy and democratic systems. Um, and there is something I think there is something important as we think about race. There is an irreducible quality about race that you can fix a lot of other factors. You can take, you can, you can, you can fix, you can respond to economic questions and all the other factors that make up diversity. And race will still have significant impacts on all the other meaningful measures and outcomes, whether it, the opportunities to learn, the opportunities for fair treatment, whether it's healthcare, whether it's education, race still has a significant impact. And so while I'm not minimizing any of the studies that you've identified, I think we also need to recognize that there is an element to race that is fundamentally irreducible that does have a significant impact, at least the way that race has historically manifested in this country. That is not defining for the future, and that doesn't mean that's the way it has to be tomorrow or for our children, and I hope that is not what it needs to be for our children, but I do think we need to acknowledge that there is, there is something unique about race in the context of diversity that does not necessarily manifest itself in these other aspects. Yeah, I will, first of all, I certainly didn't think you were being divisive at all, and so I apologize mm -hmm. if that's how it came across. Uh, the, I agree with what you just said, and I think that uh, particularly the emphasis on the history of this country, and of course it's not only the history of this country, you could go you mm -hmm. know, Brazil, you could go, I mean, you could go right through mm -hmm. a list of a variety of countries, but we're in our country, and in our country there's absolutely no question that the, the fault line of race mm -hmm. has been central to the American failure and success. Uh, and uh, and is absolutely the frontier on which we have to pay tremendous attention and, and, and bring the insights that you, you sketched out. Uh, I would also say that, and this is maybe a longer conversation, but each of the different categories that we can talk about, race, sex, religion, et cetera, play out in similar, in some aspects, but also different ways. Mm -hmm. And one of the big differences for race, I'll be interested if you agree with this, because you've obviously put a lot of work into this, is that <clears throat> unlike some of those other categories and fault lines, and obviously people can have and do have multiple identities and are parts of multiple groups, but um, Many of these other groups cut across a lot of lines in a way that race does not. Mm -hmm. People are, people tend to be uh, more more separated when mm -hmm. it comes to race, and therefore it is a harder and and uh, more challenging effort to succeed in diversity and inclusion when it comes to dealing with race than it is with some of the other categories that still encounter exclusion, experience. Uh, uh, exclusion, denial, mm -hmm. lack of opportunity, and so on, but people are still more integrated. People are more bumping shoulders with people of those categories, et cetera. We, we all, almost all of us, are either are women or have women in our family. Sure. Uh, gay people, as we famously say, are everywhere, even if though we're not visibly everywhere. But you don't usually wake up and find yourself in a family with someone of a different race. Not that it doesn't happen, not that it can't happen, mm -hmm. but it doesn't initially happen, typically, for most people. And the communities are separate, off, of course, in part because of that history in the law. Mm -hmm. And therefore, for those kinds of dynamics, I think the, the points you're making are absolutely true when it comes to the kind of attention that needs to be given to race. Sure. <coughs> we'll cede control back to you at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. This yeah. is the way it should be going. That was the first question. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, Evan, uh, I was interested in, in uh, what you said at, uh, in the interview. Uh, about the outreach that uh, the Freedom to Marry campaign had across uh, races, genders, and you, you really did uh, reach out to other organizations to bring them in to support this campaign. And that's, that's what, I, what I'd love for you to just say a little bit more about. Well, the, one of the things that distinguishes Freedom to Marry from many of the other kinds of organizations and institutions that we are all part of and that uh, Rockefeller supports and so on is that Freedom to Marry was conceived of as a campaign. I wasn't trying to build an institution. I wasn't trying to 
create an entirely separate movement to last forever toward a multiplicity of purposes. Freedom to Marry was a campaign created to drive a strategy to a goal. And once the goal was achieved, we were then able to declare victory and be done, even though the movement and the work continue. And so what we focused on doing was what was needed to be done to succeed on that goal and succeed on our strategy. <clears throat> One of my rules of activism, <coughs> excuse me, fighting this cold, is uh, that you don't need every, you just need enough. And so it wasn't really about browbeating every single individual, every single organization, every single funder, et cetera, to support this goal and this strategy, but it was about trying to persuade enough that this goal was important to them as well as to us, plural, and, uh, and that the strategy was the right strategy and so on. And so it was the goal, the clarity of the goal and the clarity of the strategy as well as then the work that then resulted from that that would inspire and bring people in. Then we also had to create a structure and approach that would allow everybody to play their part and to get the credit and to bring their piece to the combined effort to get their funding, to get their lime, uh, spotlight, etc. And as long as they were doing so in furtherance of the strategy to the goal, that worked. It didn't matter to Freedom to Marry who got the credit. It didn't matter that we would necessarily get all the funding. In fact, I would often be saying to funders, uh, if you don't want to put it through my watering can, as long as you're watering the field, mm -hmm. that's, that's fine. And so it was, a, it was the strategy and the goal that was able, and then the, the work within that to try to skillfully, diplomatically, deferentially and directively drive those things that allowed a critical mass of organizations and allies and partners and individuals to come into this work, some not even knowing that any of that existed, but by virtue of the, the conversation or the cause itself would come in. And what Freedom to Marry was able to do was to be the organization that kept its eyes on the prize of the goal and more importantly even the strategy and not only have to be focused on the work we were doing. As long as each person's, each organization's piece was contributing to the strategy, we could be happy. And, as in, and where there were gaps and things that weren't happening or, or communities not being addressed or faces not being presented or stories not being heard, we could then work to try to fill those gaps either by enlisting someone or by directly doing it ourselves. We didn't pay attention only to the work we were doing. We paid attention primarily to the strategy. And so it was that combination of a, a movement, a field from which to draw and which to leverage and which to inspire and organically or through encouragement, a strategy, a movement, a strategy, and a campaign that succeeded clarity of vision and a commitment to the cause. And the strategy. And the strategy. Thank you. Uh, to what extent uh, is this a time in this country uh, for greater cooperation and collaboration among kindred organizations? Uh, and are foundations, uh, for example, more willing to invest in developing such efforts? Um. Collaboration is um, absolutely essential. Um, I think one of the challenges as a foundation is how do you support collaborations in a way that's healthy and fruitful? Um, you, want, you want organizations to come together in a way that allows everyone to bring their best selves to the table um, in a way that advances, that advances their mutuality of goals uh, without while still operating in an environment that oftentimes, um, and I think you kind of alluded to this, there's a perceived scarcity of resources. It isn't always easy to get people to perceive and see that there's kind of enough um, in really trying to figure out how to move forward together. Um, there are times when uh, foundations will be the impetus for coalitions 
um, and will be the impetus to both pull things together. That is one of the things we bring to the table beyond simply financial resources, but is the, is the uh, ability to bring folks together to coalesce and to have meetings. And when we actually do joint funding, you know, at best you want it to be an arranged marriage, you want to kind of get away from the shotgun wedding sort of approach. Um, we don't want to force organizations to come together in a way that isn't easy for them to work with. But sometimes you, you do want to arrange organizations that may not have otherwise come together, but you can see a way, for, you can see a way clear for them to work together. Um, so one of the examples, and I'll use uh, that sort of contemporaneous, is um, right now there's such an enormous amount of energy in communities around resistance groups and a lot of community groups, right? So we're seeing a lot of, um, like the Women's March, right? So the Women's March is huge. How many people marched, showed up, paid attention, right? Like it was everyone. And, um, and now the Women's March has in, so they've, has, any, has anyone huddled? By the Women's March? Okay. And so, does anyone know, does anyone know what I'm talking about when I'm saying huddle for the Women's March? Okay. So, the Women's March has then now created these opportunities for women to come together in community in huddles, right? To take that energy and kind of come together in community and try and figure out what to do and take that energy and do other things and endorse candidates or, and maybe get together with Pantsuit Nation and do some other things. And so, kind of create these sort of opportunities. Well, in a lot of these places, right, there are community organizations that already exist that have been working <coughs> for years, what I would call sort of resistance plus organizations that have been working on these issues of women's rights, immigrant rights, community, fair, like for decades, decades, right? And they are not necessarily like, and so, and but they're not necessarily in the same relationship with people who kind of just got fired up in November of 2016. And so how do we, how do we assist these communities to come together in partnership when they don't necessarily have the same worldview or the long view, but we know that even in the short term, we really do have to figure out how to come together because we are not going to see um, maybe the, the types of community cohesion if these bases don't come together. So it's those kinds of conversations that we're really trying to build to create um, community awareness, sharing conversation, to be able to build cohesive communities and shared conversation that allow greater strength in these spaces. And I think, so we're trying to figure out what's the best way to bring these folks together and how do we do it? You know, and ideally you wanna say, how do we do this organically in a way this is gonna happen naturally? This doesn't always happen naturally. But so how do we do it in a way that's at least not offensive and really kind of do it in a way that everyone sees value and the way they come together, provide mutual incentives and have it be um, a more positive experience for having been there than not. Thank you. Um, uh, in our book, uh, Mohammed Chandri of the Silicon Valley Education Foundation advises that before you seek funding, truly seek agreement on how the dial will be moved. Agree on the measurement and then the solution. Tell me what dial you want to move and what number, if moved, will have the best impact for me, that, that's the number of students that graduate from high school having completed the courses required to college. Uh, uh, from our, my organization that I serve on the board of, it's a coalition of 100 women's organizations. Pay equity is uh, a, a major issue. We've, we've made some success there. So is, is the next measurement for us that we're considering is, uh, well, how many companies will voluntarily show their uh, salaries based on gender and race. You know, can, can we make that the next needle we move? Because uh, they don't like regulation, let's see if we can do it voluntarily. Uh, so if there was one dial that could be moved more quickly and effectively through collaboration or collective action, what would you choose? Shifting Congress, <coughs> taking back Congress. I think our country is in an, a moment of dire peril and deeply on the wrong track. And while there are many, many causes that I'm sure many of us care about and support, and there are so many communities and values that are under attack, we are in a fight to preserve our republic and to restore and reinvigorate our democracy. And if we succeed in doing those things, everything else we all care about and must work on remains possible. And if we don't do that, we are facing the possibility of a historic loss. And so the most important thing 
all of us need to be doing is getting rid of this current regime and taking back Congress. And it probably has to go in the other order, though time will tell. Thank you. Keisha? So I will talk about a C3 answer. OK. <laughs> and, um, so uh, while not disagreeing, uh, while not disagreeing um, from, a, from a public charity response, we obviously cannot fund and advocate for um, specific political responses. So. Um, so what I would like to do is back up a little bit and kind of say the frame that was given was very Silicon Valley direct service. What's your measurement? How many students do you serve? How many people can you graduate? I don't know if you listen to like the list of people that I listed as grantees. These are advocacy organizations, right? To measure success in advocacy organizations doesn't always fall in these neat boxes. And sometimes when you're talking about advocacy, you get to a specific goal, like we're going to pass marriage and there's a thing. Um, and, but sometimes advocacy can be a little fuzzy Right, so sometimes it's really nice when you have a specific goal around advocacy and, um, and we should do as much as we can to identify what these goals are and I can speak a little bit to that in a minute. But one of the other things we have to think about is what are we thinking about for outcomes? So one of the things um, I, hear, I, I, I hear a lot is um, movement for black lives, um, particularly when the movement first started, and you had a lot of people marching, a lot of direct action, and you heard a lot of people saying, what do these people want? What are the policies people are looking for? What are these outcomes people want? What, what do you want? What do you want? What are you marching for? What's that policy you're seeking? And my response was, well, what policy should they be marching for to not shoot unarmed black men in the street, to let them die in the street like animals? What policy do you think that should be? It's already illegal. There is not one animating moment in the movement for black lives, in our contemporary moment, that has not already been an illegal action that they had to raise an affirmative defense for the murder of any of these young men. Not one. This was not about a policy solution. This was about culture and behavior change to give a life and meaning to the promises and the policies that have already been made. So we have to be a little cautious when we talk about what is that thing, what is that moment, what is that policy, what is that thing, right? So that's one thing I'm gonna say, right? We've got that little cautionary note. Flip side of that coin, even in an advocacy frame, you have to do better than, we just want to do better, like a, a broad mission statement, right? Um, people are like, I wanna build power in community. Well, how do you know when you've succeeded? When the community is powerful. Ah, now you're just moving words around, right? It's not quite the same thing. You have to have a clear, articulable goal, right? That has a clarity of purpose such that you know if you're getting closer or further away. And most often what happens is you're getting closer, but in such small increments, it almost doesn't matter. But like you really have to figure out what is that thing? And what are the conditions you are seeking to create to get you to that, to create that vision, to create those outcomes? And then you can define the strategies for which you create those conditions. You don't necessarily always have to have this sort of like, I hit X percent, or I hit this number over that number. But if you don't have a clear, compelling, articulable outcome for how you are defining the success of your work, it will be very, very difficult to ever understand if you're getting closer or further away. And it becomes very difficult for someone on this side of the table to really have any clarity on how to support you in doing that work. Thank you, and I, and I agree. And uh, I think Catherine McKinnon uh, did a great op-ed on Friday in the Times about how you know uh, equal pay for equal work legislation uh, was signed by uh, John Kennedy. <laughs> uh, we're still 70 cents, 77 cents on the dollar. So uh, and the Me Too movement also uh, is moving uh, uh, towards uh, more positive outcomes than some of our uh, laws have been able to do. Uh, you know since they've become laws against sexual, sexual harassment. Um, it's 610, so I, I want to ask uh, one more question, and I'm going to ask if you've got favorite jokes. Uh, and I have a couple from the book. 
tell you uh, tell us a little bit about your journey in the social justice world uh, uh, what set you on your particular course of activism and uh, and what sustains you now in that work so as even as a young kid I always cared about politics and history very passionate always and still about history and reading history enjoying learning about it visiting it etc so uh, I always was drawn to the idea of uh, fighting for justice making a better world that was reinforced by my family and my community uh, and my education and so on but it really was just always a passion that I had and um, when I you know, there's a long story and a short story I mean the, the, sh the short story is that uh, when in law school as you mentioned we had to write a paper on um, something really we had to write a paper on some legal change or something we wanted I at that point had served in the Peace Corps I had had this passionate commitment to history almost all my life I had wanted to I, I had come out as gay I realized that the way things were were not the way they should be and so I wanted to write about how to change that and uh, I drew on two major formative experiences I can't now remember if I told you this story in the book or not um, one was that having served in the Peace Corps I lived in a small village in West Africa teaching a variety of things for two years and uh, it was during that period that I began really having sex with guys I was 21 <clears throat> and I realized that some of the guys I was having sex with in my small village in West Africa uh, were not gay they were having sex with me either because they liked me or we were all young and it was sex so what the hell or they were curious or they were being accommodating but it wasn't really for them but others I realized if they lived in a society where they had the ability to imagine themselves as gay and to live a life as gay probably would be gay and so what that taught me as a 21 year old was the not particularly brilliant insight but it was new to me as a 21 year old that who you are is profoundly shaped by the society in which you live the choices that society gives you even the language that the society gives you they had no language for what a life as who I believed they actually were would be so I took that lesson to heart as a kid came back went to law school and in my second year of law school my passion for history drew me to read the book that changed my life and that book was called Christianity Social Tolerance and Homosexuality and it was a groundbreaking award-winning massive piece of scholarship that traced the first 3,000 years of Western civilization from biblical times through to the Renaissance written in 16 different languages, thousands of footnotes. I loved it. I wrapped it in a fake cover and took it down to visit my parent, my grandparents on the beach in Florida, devouring this tome. And the lesson I took away from that, that history was that the way societies had treated homosexuality and gay people had varied wildly through the different eras. It was not the same as ours was and how we had been taught to think it needed to be. And so the, the lesson I took from that was if it had once been different it could be different again now when it came time for me to write my thesis in law school I took those two life experiences and I thought to myself why is it that gay people are discriminated against and I decided it's because fundamentally of who we love so then I thought well what is the preeminent language in this and virtually every other society that's ever existed of love it's the language of marriage so I thought if we can claim the language of marriage we will be as you quoted earlier seizing this engine of transformation that would not only help us to win marriage something important in and of itself but actually would change non-gay people's understanding of who gay people are by evoking the common values the paper was titled same-sex marriage and morality the human rights vision of the Constitution and it was not so much a special pleading piece for gay people that would have that section it was about the common values the the common language the common aspirations 
and the ways in which we could draw from feminism, from the gay experience, from history, from popular culture, from philosophy, to come to a true understanding of what the American vision ought to be. So this is the way I really always thought, and the pieces came together uh, in that paper, and then I spent the next 32 years trying to make up for the B I got on the paper, because it was a completely <laughs> non-law school-y kind of paper, with the extracurricular at work of 32 years of fighting to make it happen, and here we are. <coughs> That's awesome. <laughs> um, the path. I think, uh, you know, I think growing up, the I was always, uh, as, far, as far back as I can remember, um, growing up, I was always the only one. I was largely in all white schools, and so it was always me um, in all my classrooms, in elementary school, junior high. When I got to high school, uh, there were, it was a 2,000 students in my high school, there were 10 black students. Um, and it was just sort of a, a sort of existence you sort of adjust to and kind of figure out. Um, and my parents, my mother was uh, sort of a stalwart about teaching me lessons while not teaching me lessons. Um, so I remember like in eighth grade we had to do a project and we had to pick a country and I was like, I think I'm gonna do my country like Austria. She's like, you know, I think you should do your country on South Africa. I'm like South Africa? I heard of South Africa. I'm like, all right, fine, I'll do it on South Africa. And so I start doing it in South Africa. And this, of course, um, is during apartheid because I'm old. And um, and uh, and so I'm doing the research, and I go to my mother. I'm like, have you heard about this? I'm like, this is. Do you understand what's going on there? She's like, really? Huh? I guess somebody should probably do something about that. And I'm like, well, somebody really should. And kind of always having in my entire life, you know, kind of my mother kind of being, maybe you should, well, maybe you should just think about that. Well, why, why, why would somebody do something that way? And spending all of this time really making sure, you know, all my reports were always on like an important figure in black history and always this and always making sure that this, that, that it was regardless of what my environment was, it was persistently grounded in an experience that let me know no matter how, how isolated I may have felt that there was a history and something about me that it went deep into not just my personal experience, but in this country. And for me, what that meant was I grew up with a very acute feeling of entitlement that this is my country. Just a really cute feeling. I mean, like when she took, I mean, she took me to all the historical sites in this country and, you know, the slave ships as well as the White House and all the things, but very acute feeling that this is my country. And you're not going to tell me otherwise. And I couldn't, I never could understand when people were like, well, that's not for us. So that's not for this. I'm like, well, of course it is. <coughs> you know, and there's other stories I won't share about my acute sense of entitlement, but the um, <laughs> the um, but as I went through as I as I went through and I got to undergrad and um, and I went to a state I went to a state school and at some point we were on quarters and the school decided we wanted to move to semesters and I was on student government because student government was a thing. And when you're on student government, you think it's very important. And you actually have no idea how powerless you are. But you know, I was a senator, so I knew. And, and so I said, well, they can't do this. The students don't want this. We're going to have an election. It was not a sanctioned election. We're going to do it. So I like, sponsored this election. We're going to do this. We had this formal election, the biggest turnout we'd ever had. The students said, overwhelmingly, this is not something that can happen. And then the administration said, that's nice. It's happening. And I was like, well, wait a minute, like, but then what's all the student government stuff for? And what is all this democracy stuff for? And what is all this for? What does all this mean if there's no real power? And I was like, well, wait a minute. We need, we need to have like real power in this place. And so it was like, I just, it kept sort of happening. Um, and then the following year, our student, <laughs> our student center, printed a bunch of calendars. You know, they do the cute little calendars. This is what's happening. And on January 15th, they printed National Nothing Day. Hmm. 
she got it. So January 15th, they printed National Nothing Day, and I was like, this is an atrocity. And I marched right down, they're like, you have to reprint these calendars. And they're like, oh no, that's too expensive. We're sorry, it was a mistake, we apologize, but no, we're not doing it. And I was like, well, of course you're doing it. And then I said, well, I went down to the, the city paper, which was a Gannett News outlet, which was known as USA Today. And it got picked up by the local paper and then got picked up by USA Today and then got picked up by National News. And so then I was interviewed on ABC News and they're like, oh, they're gonna change it. And then I was like, oh, wait a minute, this is what power looks like. <laughs> and I'm like, wait a minute. And so it was this whole exercise in what I thought was democracy and what I thought was power and then what was real power and really trying to figure out how do you do this? How do you make this work? How do you exercise fairness and outcomes for people who need it? How do you represent people? How do you make this work? And I was a criminal justice and political science dual major, which meant you go to law school, because what else, what are you gonna do with that? And, um, and I went to law school, and I just had spent so much of my life watching things evolve and just feeling like this, we can do better. We can do better for this country. We can do better for people. There is no reason that people should live like this. There is no reason our democracy shouldn't serve our people. And therefore, I have spent, God, this is my third redistricting cycle. Um, <laughs> I have spent most of my adult life working on relatively obscure, um, really wonky, incredibly important, absolutely essential elements of our democracy and honestly not winning very much at all. But the wins have been incredibly important and the victories have mattered, the losses have been huge and I'm going to keep doing it until they put me in the ground and it's just what I do because it's what we have to do. And it's incredibly important and it's just what drives me every single day. So I don't really have like a cool story. That's I don't. That's a great story. Um, you know, Thank that's you. it. Thank you. You, you both uh, don't take no for an answer, and you both have a confidence that, you know, you, you can change things. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, we're going to open it up. Questions? Mark. Yeah. Uh, regarding the issue of pay equity between uh, men and women, uh, how, in practical terms, do you envision getting the statistics uh, that really show this equity, this uh, inequity from corporation to corporation. I mean, uh, the, uh, the businesses themselves incorporate this disparity into their business model. That's how they get some of their profits. Um, the people who work in these places may need to somehow have a vehicle where they could voluntarily disclose their salaries. Uh, you know, like Me Too, they could say, hashtag uh, my salary. Uh, so that somehow these statistics in each company can be, uh, can be publicized and therefore start shaming corporations into giving pay equity. Because like you said, uh, it's on the books that there should be uh, equal pay, but uh, in real terms, with the way things are, uh, how do you envision getting this pay equity to happen? In a way, I think you answered your own question, right? Other than a voluntary movement of people disclosing their own salaries, I think it would be a tough road to hoe from like a congressional standpoint, getting like getting a law passed. I just don't know if this particular Congress would be willing to step up and force corporations to disclose. Um, so either a change <laughs> in who's, who would actually force the decisions, the force well, the a hand. Well, the hashtag campaign mm -hmm. did force some decisions mm -hmm. that, uh, that Washington had no part in. Right, uh, so that's what I'm saying. So I think it, that, that was my first point. I think you may have answered your own question that if in fact there was a voluntary campaign where people engaged and actually started disclosing, um, corporations themselves would probably need to respond, but that is a pretty big culture shift. We have a very strong culture in this country of not disclosing salaries, mm -hmm. and we would have to, we would have to, the, the asymmetry of information does not serve anyone but companies. 
we have persuaded most workers that they benefit from this asymmetry. Um, people would have to be persuaded that they, that asymmetry no longer serves them. There's some work, you know. We, we've got the. Uh, it took 15 years just to get the little piece of New York State legislation uh, passed. After same-sex marriage went through, after medicinal marijuana went through, uh, after safe guns went through in New York State. 15 years it took to get a little piece of pay equity legislation passed, where now employees in New York State uh, uh, d will not uh, can't be punished. Uh, for uh, saying, uh, talking about their salaries <coughs> in the workplace. And New York City, again, we helped uh, through Power New York, a coalition of 100 women's organizations, uh, helped shape the salary history uh, legislation. Uh, and that's, we think that's about changing social norms, you know? Who, who would have thought that that would help uh, not only men, uh, uh, not only women, all these laws are for men and women. Uh, uh, if, if you didn't ask about your salary history, because the answer is now, well, uh, I was discriminated against before and had a lower salary. Why would I want to tell you my salary? <laughs> so there, it, is, it is starting to cha you know, change things. Uh, this larger issue of the uh, compensation uh, and revealing it, there are some uh, governments that are doing it and the sky hasn't fallen in I think in Minnesota some legislation and also uh, in New Mexico uh, uh, you know we're talking about seeing if New York State will open its books in this way I mean that that's they're, they're huge you know employers so there's a lot of work to be done and we're we're trying to see what part we can do uh, next on this, it's 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 pay equity get uh, across job titles, mm -hmm. basically. It's not just equal pay for equal work. I wanted to ask you a question, really about what you just said. I'm Michelle Winfield from the community. You want them the New York State to open their books. Who have you asked? I just want to know what direction you've moved to because you're talking about strategies, you're talking about which direction to go and how you collaborate. I am state committee woman in this area. So what direction have you? Two in particular, the Women's Commission in New York City. Excellent. And, and then uh, the mayor's office. We, we, our coalition collaborates with that office. Okay. So, uh, you know, she, he's, he's said in his agenda that pay equity isn't, you know, a priority. Now we have to see if you know, he'll move on some of those things. And there's, there's competing legislation. So, you know, that we try to help to bring people together so that at least something gets passed. So. Okay. Oh. Yes. Yes, Keisha, you mentioned um, systemic issues, um, I guess structural issues in the economy and uh, justice system that perpetuate conditions of poverty. Can you be more specific about that? Perhaps identify um, some organizations addressing it in terms of, um, say, measurable outcomes that they might have? Sure. Um, well, okay, so we've got, so when we talk about systemic challenges around our democracy, there's a couple of different ways we approach some of these questions. Um, some of it is elections and voting rights. So in our election systems, we look at um, we look at modernizing our elections processes, as well as uh, redistricting, right? Drawing the district lines, which then will exclude folks or include folks in ways um, that that really undermine fair representation. Um, and so in New York, that could be Common Cause, um, um, organizations like the Brennan Center. Uh, and, and others that work on some of these questions. When we talk about the economy, there's a couple different ways of thinking about it. Um, to keep it, in, in other words, sort of simplistic, hyper-simplistic, right? Um, one of the challenges right now is the changing nature of our economy. Um, the financialization of our economy, where more and more of our economy is being consumed by uh, financial transactions rather than by means of production, right? So we have now like almost a third of our, our economy 
is driven by financial transactions. That's about 1% of the workforce, right? This is not the 1%, but just 1% of the workforce is driving a third of the economy. Um, and one of the challenges is that bit of the economy is driven by debt and debt-based transactions. That's entirely extractive. Right, and so it's it's a completely different type of economic growth, which pulls which pulls money, right? From which is unlike where we see growth in um, in a manufacturing context, right? Where if, where if we all kind of make more money and then we buy more things, you have you have a symbiotic growth between the economy and individuals earning and making more and spending more. When you've got when you've got a debt driven economy, you've got an economy that's driven by more debt and more interest. And people going the other direction. You actually have people making less as the economy grows. Like we've got some very serious structural problems with how the economy is changing. And so we have organizations like the Roosevelt Institute and Demos actually doing some work in these areas. So I mean, we could do this for a long time. So I don't want to take up too much time with the answer. But those are some of the things that come to top of mind. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question uh, first to Evan, then probably next to Keisha. What was the book? The Christianity. Sorry, Christianity. Social Tolerance and Homosexuality. Is that the, the title of the book? Yeah, that's the title of the book. The author is John Boswell. John Boswell. And my next question is about the aspect of power itself, and especially if you were talking about institutions like Christianity and church, and probably like you might think they're, they're the oldest foundation of all, the one that's not taxed. Um, my question is that how do you discuss the issue of power and fear and in the relationship of that with, like you just uh, said about the future economy that's really like debt and um, equity transition, transaction driven, uh, how do you discuss that in, in the book as well as what do you see in the future in terms of solutions and or challenges to narrow the inequality? Well, unfortunately I was not interviewed for the book, so mm -hmm. I'm not in the um, so I, I'm so sorry. So you're asking about the relationships between power and structures? Yeah, and then like the, the inherent fear behind that historically about like there's a relationship between power and, and fear, more or less. And how is that going to relate in the new economy that you just mentioned about the uh, debt-driven economy? I think the challenge, I mean, the debt-driven economy, there's all kinds of fear, right? And I think, Evan, I think probably some of the work that you did, I mean, like, as we think about fear, as we fear, there's all kinds of fear. Um, one of the challenges in the debt-driven economy is, like, fear, you know, fear, instability, right? And so people needing more and more debt or more, just needing more and more things and that sort of thing. Like there's all, people in power prey on fear, right? To, to keep people sort of in place. Like debt and fear, these are all mechanisms of control, right? And so I think without getting, you know, too philosophical, um, I would say that these are all these are all control mechanisms that people in power are able to leverage through like common cultural sort of memes going back to just even as simple as a concept of asymmetry around pay, right? They've been able to frame somehow that we have more to lose by telling each other what we earn. Right? What am, what am I so afraid of? How have they gotten me so afraid that someone sitting next to me knowing how much they earn is gonna cost me my job, it's gonna cost me. What is it gonna cost me? They're not gonna fire everybody all at once if we share our salaries. It's not going to happen. But being afraid of that is enough to keep it from happening. <coughs> and so I think it, it's a control, these are all elements of control. How they relate to individual campaigns or opportunities or things like that, I think is a much, much longer conversation. But I would say that's how I think of like kind of those questions in a short answer. I don't know, Evan, what do you think? Well, you're more of an expert in the economic structures yeah. and you, find, you, know, you, you grant in that area and you've studied mm -hmm. it and so on. I would, just, I would add another piece to that, which is that there have been other periods in our country's history where we've put a lot more investment into the sh what I would call the civic infrastructure, the shared space, mm -hmm. that, that give people greater opportunities. So separate from the job creation mm -hmm. dynamics mm -hmm. that Keisha identified, uh, which, you know, is a thorny problem. There's definitely the exploitation and the fear around it, but there are 
there are trends in the global economy, automation, et cetera, that, that require economic adaptation that even a benign, uh, well-meaning group of people may not have 100% solved yet. But alongside that, we also in this country have slashed and burned the investment in the things that gave people more uh, opportunities, you know, the health care, access to health care, uh, social security, education. Uh, educa absolutely, education, uh, free college education in some places, or certainly vastly more affordable, um, unions and, and institutions that brought people together to be able to bargain and, and collectively act. Uh, the, the whole idea of investing in, I mean, even jobs programs, you know, roads and infrastructure and internet and all the things we could be doing with our wealth in this country that would create a more, it's not even just a question of an even playing field, it's, just, it's you know, an even set of opportunities for people to contribute as well as to live their life free of additional burdens that have been piled on top of them, even as the economic structures have shifted. Mm -hmm. So. There's, there's that whole economic structures area, but there's also this political project of reinvigorating our commitment to the civic infrastructure and to the shared opportunities and the lift all boats programs that in our country's most successful period, rough, you know, roughly, let's say the 30s, certainly the 40s, up through the 70s, up into the, you know, until 1980, basically, with many imperfections in many other areas that needed a lot of work, including the ones Keisha and I have devoted a lot of energy to, never, no period is perfect. But in that period, we saw a different philosophy and a different commitment of the American people to using government as a force for good, to shared enterprise, to civic space that gave, economically speaking, a tremendous boost to tens and millions, to hundreds of millions of lives. We have uh, one question, <coughs> one burning question. I have a one, one thing you guys haven't addressed at all is character. And I actually got the opportunity to turn up weeks ago to meet John Lewis, um, the civilian leader with Martin Luther King. And, you know, they took the, the black lives also <coughs> with the convey of character. And I think it's funny because it was on The View, the television show, I worked sometimes on that set. And you know, they're cross-referencing everything, and he was like, the power of everything is just simply love. And everybody at that table was so angry, you know, trying to all this emotion in him. He's like, I'm so stable on the word love that that's how I penetrate it through character. And I'm thinking, with all, I agree with everything you guys said. I think it's phenomenal. You guys are great speakers. But character is, is one of the main things. I mean, if you think about it, there is successful black people at high levels. There is successful Hispanic at high levels. What is the difference between them? I mean, some of the people that I work with had nothing and grew themselves to something. So they're no different than poverty-driven people, correct? So no, that's not correct. No. So, OK. <laughs> <laughs> She's okay. allow for everyone to oh, have that option. Okay. So, when somebody goes up there, and mm -hmm. I mean, specifically one NFL player that's had a rough time that I'm very good friends with, had broken through those walls. That's also setting an example if he displays his voice, because that obviously is driven through character. He's, he's risen up through his character, through his experiences, and overcame those hurdles. So if there is examples out there, why is there such a big gap from this loophole of a ton of people that don't know how that had happened. Is there something that you see if there's only a select few of some over here that's made it through that cross feeling, yet there's this huge pile that haven't? What, what is the gap between that if it's not character? If the family didn't give their money, what is it? It's that's structural it. racism. It's a systemic issue. Speak up. It's a systemic problem. So systemic racial like issue. That.
We don't have what the legal papers, the green card that people in this country are born by birth. You know what I mean? And it comes, it, it's like rooted on entitlement, it's rooted on um, like, well, like what I said, it's a systemic problem. The government <coughs> will put people of color, like myself, in these um, communities and kind of like entrap you, right? So this is all you can afford. Um, we didn't have papers, so we couldn't get health care, we couldn't get Medicaid. So my parents had to figure out how we're going to like help ourselves, so yeah? How we're going to get a green card. And, and I don't know if you know, but the legal system in this country is very narrow. And even more so now that Trump's in town, right? And he's really out to really destroy and dismantle um, the labor of this country. Those are the people who are washing your dishes, people who are washing your cars, people who are taking care of your kids. And you kind of just have to follow where the money is going, right? It's the elite, the affluent people. Um, I'm also a graduate of Baruch College. I went to Jack very closely. Um, and you know, like my life, everything that happened to me, I had every single negative, but I made it into a positive. But I had those opportunities. I also had the backing of my family, my community, it's dry, but it's also like you have to have that click aha moment, right? And a lot of people of color, a lot of in, like low income people, or what Trump likes to say, poor people, um, if you don't have that gateway, that access, that mentor, that person to really like uplift you, then unfortunately you do stay in like the projects or like you're undocumented or, you know, your life is you're gonna work a low wage job. Um, and I didn't have my papers for over 19 years now. I guess I said character because I ran into a situation a couple years ago where I found out I worked at a company for four years and I'm a typical so-called beautiful blonde haired woman, right? I should be getting everything. I found out um, through a weave of asking people about their pay wage, I was the lowest one getting paid. And I say this, this is the first time I actually shared this out loud, but I was so sad. It took four years until I realized this, working for a company that I devoted my heart to because of people who judged my character. So it's not just racism, it's not just, there's other things going on that haven't even arose yet. You know, and, and something like that, most people would be like, how can that happen? Well, it did happen, there was a huge investigation, there was, it was plain point and center that I was being discriminated against my character. So. That's why I drive the character home. That's why I sit in all these Fordham universities, Harvard's, and I listen to the structure that every place has is not working. You know, so if the structure's not working, we're still being put in a box. So we're running around in this box, but what, what are we actually doing inside of that box that's pushing us forward? You know, so it, it can't, it's not just race. It's not just gays. It's not, it is character. Because if they truly appreciated who I was giving the best service, or giving what I knew I could in that company, they would have valued my character. So, if I, if I hear you correctly, and I, because and, I think I might have misunderstood what you were saying when you first started talking, um, and so you're gonna have to, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and get this right, because I'm gonna, first I'm gonna own something, right? A couple of things you said when you first started talking were big flags for me, and so I like flashed, like, so I responded, right? So I'm like, all right, so I'm trying to, backtrack and respond to what I what I what I think you hear me saying so I think a couple of other people may have had that so um, I'm gonna do my best to respond to what I think you're saying which is there is some fundamental inequity going on in this country where there are people with power that are making arbitrary decisions that are impacting people's opportunity to learn people's opportunity to earn people's opportunities to succeed based on whatever reason suits them to maximize their interests. The points we were making doesn't mean, because people who exist at intersections of gender, race, queerness, who will experience a lot more of that, does not mean we are saying people who don't exist at these intersections will not experience it. 
What we are saying is there are some issues which you must concede. I'm sure you have been in conversations. I'm sure you have been in places where people have said things about people who look like me that were based not on our character, not on, you know, not on the fact that I'm a pretty bright person and they wouldn't know that by looking at me, not by anything other than what I look like. Right? You know that happens. I know it happens. We all know it happens. So we're not saying, oh, this is it. This is a sum total of what discrimination looks like. What we're saying is there's something very real about what this discrimination looks like, and it's no less real than what you experience, but there is something very different about it and how we experience it. And so if you feel. Oh, I'm not, no, I think every single person has their point, but I threw in mine because it, it's so off kilter. You wouldn't think of a uh, situation happening like that. Right. And so it doesn't and it doesn't feel and it doesn't feel obvious. And so I think that is one of the things when when we talk about the work that, that, that we do, right, we are also talking about what does it mean to be in these broad systems that do act, that do not actually honor our contributions as individuals. That actually look that 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 where you have broad systems and you have um, you have powerful interests that make decisions that work to minimize the contributions of individuals, to work to use things like asymmetry of information, that work to use these networks to undermine power, to make it more difficult to access resources. And it does happen to all of us. And I don't want to undermine your experience. And what I'm hoping this can do is open up an avenue of communication for us to understand a mutuality experience. And I know it could not have been easy to share that in the context of this conversation. So I appreciate you doing so. And I'm hoping that we were all equally heard. Is that fair? Oh, absolutely. OK. Mm -hmm. absolutely. Uh, Jack, do you want to start helping us to close up? and? Uh, while Jack comes up, uh, uh, who else wants to talk? <laughs> Three other people? Get it? Okay, you. One. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, this question is kind of diving into the diversity, inclusion, equity, as well as the conversation about strategy for activism. Um, so it kind of crosses both of those. But my question is around kind of allyship and building coalitions. So we work for an organization that serves uh, individuals with disabilities and their families. And so we're often talking at work about how do you bring up this idea of diversity and inclusion outside of your community. So outside of the disability world, how do you get other people to talk about disability inclusion? Outside of these communities that you guys have both worked in, how do you get other communities to talk about it? And then moving forward, how do you maintain the spirit and kind of pull them in as allies in an appropriate way? You know, the disability movement, nothing for us without us, mm -hmm. and other movements as well, Black Lives Matter, all of that. How do you pull them in? How do you get other people talking about it? And then how do you kind of address appropriate allyship, I guess. And disability does not get enough credit for nothing for us without us. Like, they literally do not. But I'm sorry, you can speak, I think, very specifically, too. Well, I, <clears throat> I think the exchange, actually, we just saw um, here, I think, is a good illustration of one way to address the, the issues you were talking about. There were many different ways to understand the things that were being said, but, but I think what Keisha uh, landed on and what you were agreeing to as well is when you use the word character it actually set me off in a different way mm -hmm. and I could go into that but I'm going to address your question which is what I think was a, one way to understand the way you were talking about character was the way Keisha explained uh, the, the desire as well as the moral rightness of being valued and given opportunities for who we are as individuals not for any number of other things imposed on us by systems or by in bad acting individuals or well-meaning but poorly educated, uh, I don't mean uh, intellectually, but just Im imbibing the cultural stuff that our society gives, um, that we want to be seen as individuals. So I think one of the effective efforts for the disability community has to be to invite people to see 
the, the desire of the individual to contribute and participate, as well as have the support and opportunity that we all need in life based on where we are in our life, um, without being prejudged or excluded based on things that shouldn't matter in that context, whether it be race or sexual orientation or, or uh, sex or um, disability. And so I think getting people who are not disabled to put themselves in the experience of what it would feel like, what does it feel like, to be told you can't do X or Y or Z simply because of A, which has nothing to do with X or Y or Z. And, there, and as we've heard tonight in many different forums from the back of the room, from the front, from here, there are many different experiences of that problem. You know, some are reinforced by history and systems. Some are just casually accepted as okay and only recently effectively challenged. But I think that's the, that's the real opportunity. It's in the benign, in the good use of the word character, we each want to be able to participate and flourish and dream and succeed uh, as based on us as individuals <laughs> supported by our and connected to our families and our communities and so on. So disability should not disable people from having that opportunity. And I think telling the stories and putting the voice forward and, and getting people to connect with empathy and visibility, much as we had to do in transforming hearts and minds around gay people through and for marriage. For me, the freedom to marry fight was both a goal and a strategy. It was an important goal in its own right, but it was also, as I said earlier, an engine of transformation that was gonna advance us in other ways by claiming the common vocabulary. And so it's that, connecting with people where they are through shared values, but also through your stories and experience that enables them to see differently the character. And also, uh, Rebecca Coakley at CAP, um, she's a senior fellow, the disability fellow at CAP, and she's doing specifically this work. She brings together tables, the whole nine, like literally talk to Rebecca Coakley. She will, sp she will help you in this work. She's amazing, absolutely amazing. Thank you all. Thank you.